Well, hey, good morning, Doxology, and Merry Christmas to you, wherever you're joining us from today. It is so great to worship with you this morning. If you got a Bible, would you go ahead and grab it and start making your way to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, it's about right smack in the middle of your Bible if you need some help finding it. Isaiah chapter 9 is where we're going to start today. As you're finding Isaiah 9, uh, I feel like I need to confess something to you today. Uh, If I feel a little distracted or maybe a little off my game this morning, it's because my least favorite day of the entire year was Friday. I'm still sort of recovering from it. Yeah, it was family picture day. (laughs) Goodness. Uh, It's better than it used to be, but Lord have mercy, that is not my favorite thing. Now, don't don't misunderstand. Photography is great. The kids do fine. The dog gets in on the action, whatever. Like, all of that's okay. It's not the thing. It's the run-up to the thing that's the thing. You know, finding the right outfits and the right spot and the right time and gauging the weather and the sunlight and the pose and getting everything to converge at exactly the right moment so that the photographer can go, click, I've got it. And then for him to do that a whole bunch of times in a short amount of time so that we can look at the proofs and go, yeah, like of all of those That's the one, like in that split second of time, that represents just as close as the Freeland family could possibly come this year to the family we aspire to be. Like we got it in that moment, we captured it. There it was. And then it went. So that we can stick that picture on a card underneath some words and mail the card to you. And the words we stick on the card is the same as the pictures we put on the card, aren't they? Like, let's be honest. Most of the time we pick words and express wishes for each other that we sincerely hope will be true for them this Christmas. But that the truth is, we're really not experiencing ourselves around Christmas, at least not in an ongoing way, right? Maybe for a snapshot, maybe for the click. Merry Christmas, click. Peace on earth, joy to the world, hope is here, click, just for the snapshot. For the most of us, the ideal it doesn't characterize our real. Like our lives don't show up looking like that most of the time. Most of the time, and come on, especially in 2020, the real looks a little more like fear, maybe a little despair, maybe loneliness, a whole lot of pressure. But maybe we think, If we could just lay everything out just right and time everything just right and organize and arrange everything in just the right way at just the right moment, we could capture a snapshot of peace or of hope or joy that we could look back at someday or maybe even share with others in a way that goes, look at us right there for that moment in a click. We had it. What if it doesn't have to be that way? What if, despite the ongoing chaos of 2020, peace could be the ongoing real for you this Christmas? What if, despite all the circumstances that can make you cynical, make you despair, make you bitter, hope could be the ongoing real for you this Christmas? What if despite the loss and the grief and the uncertainty and the, all, all of the loss of the season, what if joy could be an ongoing reel for you this year and not for an airbrushed, photoshopped, filtered, edited flicker of a moment in the everyday moments of this season, this year? That's my goal for us this year as we turn our attention to the Christmas story again. And it's not just preacher cliche or bait on the hook for a series. My goal for us this year is that when we tell the story of 2020 someday, we'd be able to say, you know, that was a terrible, difficult, disruptive year in a whole lot of ways. (laughs) But Christmas 2020, like no kidding, I have never experienced before the kind of peace I found. I'd never lived with the kind of hope I have, the joy I experience today that just won't go away. Christmas 2020 is a huge part of the reason why. Like 2020 was a pretty awful year, but not Christmas. Christmas 2020 was my best Christmas yet. 
That's where I hope we're going over the next few weeks together. This morning, I want to talk about the promise that in the Bible is the most frequently associated promise with Christmas. This morning, I want us to talk about peace. And I want to start by looking back at one of the earliest, most specific promises of Christmas that was written around 700 years before the star, where the shepherds or the baby showed up in the manger. And some context to the passage is important as we get into it. The first book, part of the book of Isaiah was written in the middle of a great big political transition. Now, I know we don't know anything about great big political transitions, but there is something about great big political transitions that disrupts societies and cultures, that exposes fears and dislodges opinions and creates chaos. You'll just have to take my word for it. It happens. And you add to that, this culture that Isaiah wrote to was a divided culture. It was actually one people lived in two different countries altogether. And for them, not figuratively, literally. And things weren't going well for them politically, economically, socially, even spiritually. For the people who were supposed to have a special relationship with God, they hadn't heard from God in a while. That's the world Isaiah wrote to. People were looking for someone with the wisdom to lead them out of this mess, with the power to lead them out of the darkness, someone who loved them enough to lead them out and to take them back to a time of flourishing and peace that, get this, they all felt like they remembered, but they hadn't ever really experienced. And their minds, and their eyes, and their focus, and their attention was all being directed towards the politics, and the circumstances, and the king. And into that chaos, God speaks. And He says this, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be, get this, on His shoulders. And He will be called. The people who know Him the best are going to say that He is a wonderful counselor. Someone with the ability to come up with wisdom and strategy to lead the way out of the mess. The mighty God, an all-powerful supernatural avenger who can rescue us from a broken world. An everlasting father, a father in the very best sense of the word, who never runs out of strength or power or love and who directs it all towards you. And finally, and ultimately, the prince of peace. Imagine somewhere in your kitchen you've got a set of nesting mixing bowls. You know what I'm talking about? There's a smaller one and then a little bigger one and then a little bigger and then the biggest and they all sit inside of each other but they all fit inside of the biggest one. All of those descriptions of the child of Jesus are important and they're all helpful and they're exactly what you and I need this Christmas. But you can think of Prince of Peace like the largest mixing bowl. All of the others fit inside that one. So that's where I want us to focus this morning. I want us to talk about the Prince of Peace. And a couple of things are really important to notice, even about that description of Jesus. It's three words in English, Prince of Peace, but it's two words in Hebrew. Prince of Peace are the Hebrew words, Sar Shalom. Sar Shalom. Let's take the second word first, okay? Because when you and I talk about peace, a lot of times we talk about it the way that the dictionary defines it. In fact, if you look to Webster, the top definition for the word peace is this. Peace is freedom from disturbance or tranquility. When we think about peace, we often think about a place or we think about a pace. Like the picture in my head when I think about peace is my front porch watching a great sunset after the kids are already in bed. Like I think of a place or I think of a, a pace. The, the tranquility piece of peace is slow and calm peace. That's the picture a bunch of us have when we think about peace. 
But look at Webster's second definition. The second way that he defines peace is this, as a state or a period in which there is no war or a war has ended. So peace talks about the absence of conflict. First definition was about a place and a pace. Second definition has to do with people and problems. When that person isn't present or when that problem goes away, peace. That's the way we use the word. But what's the problem with both of those definitions? If that's how you define peace, if that's all you're looking for when you're looking for peace, the very best you will ever hope for is the click. It's the pose, the flicker, the snapshot, the moment that's here and gone. Like I can experience this place, but not forever. The sunset, it's a moment. I can experience the pace, but not for too long. I can get rid of the person, but they're probably coming back. I can solve the problem, but there's another problem right behind that one, right? If our hope for peace is just to escape for a second or slow down for a season or get rid of the wrong person or get right in the right relationship or to find ourselves on the other side of this problem, whatever it is, if Webster's definition of peace is the best we can hope for, the pursuit of peace will kill us, won't it? Because we'll live our whole life trying to arrange everything just perfectly so that we can experience the snapshot. And then, if we find it, we'll destroy ourselves with fear and anxiety, trying to make sure that the moment doesn't go away. Good news. That's how Webster defines peace. It is not what your Heavenly Father means by shalom. Here's my favorite definition of shalom by a guy named Cornelius Plantiga. He says this, In the Bible, shalom means universal flourishing wholeness and delight, a state of affairs that inspires joyful wonder as its creator and savior opens doors and welcomes the creatures in whom he delights. And check this out. Shalom, in other words, is the way things ought to be. See, really, he's saying shalom is God's ideal the world, the way the world was designed to work. See, understand, shalom has always been God's plan. And yet, tragedy comes in early in our story, and shalom is wrecked. Plantica says shalom is vandalized. We come to understand the ideal isn't our real, because each one of us, in big ways and in small ways, have painted over shalom to add our own signature, add our own look and feel to it to the point that the original intent is hard to even recognize anymore. It's been vandalized. But the story of the Bible is that God is in the process of restoring His creation to His intent. And someday we'll get to experience it completely, but He's not waiting until someday to restore it. He's starting with you and me, inviting us to live in shalom here and now, to experience the ideal even in the middle of the real. And how's he going to accomplish it? Well, it's not by getting rid of a whole bunch of stuff. It's not through places or paces or people or problems. It's not by getting rid of stuff. He's going to accomplish it by bringing someone over the stuff. You see, he's sending someone. He promises Isaiah, who will be the Tsar Shalom. Our Bibles call him the Prince of Peace. That works, but Sar is a bigger word than Prince. Sar, S-A-R, is a Hebrew word that later on became Sar, C-Z-A-R, in some cultures. And in fact, in Rome, it becomes Caesar. See, Sar means the one in charge of everything. The chief, the general, the supreme, ultimate commander, the captain, El Jefe, the one who controls it all. So notice what God promises these people living in darkness, people whose world is in chaos, whose leaders are corrupt, whose country is divided and weak. He says, the child will be the Lord of Shalom. 
In a world like yours, you're not going to find shalom from a politician. You're not going to find shalom in a place or at a pace or absent a person or a problem. You will only find shalom in the presence and under the rule of someone. Do you see that? That is so important because it gives us the answer to the next question that all of us have. How do I find that? I mean, 2020, it's chaos out there. It's chaos in here. Don't give me 700-year-old promises without some down-to-the-minute help, right? Like, I know who the baby is. I tuned into church today. Jesus is the reason for the season. I'm keeping Christ in Christmas. Like, I get it. And I still don't have that. What do I have to do to have a little more shalom, ideal, and a little less circumstantial, real, this Christmas? Can I give you three things? And they're here even in this verse, even though they get clearer even as you go along and find some other verses. Let me give you the first one. If you want to experience peace, shalom, for more than just a snapshot this Christmas, here's the first move for every single one of us. It's this. Bring everything under Jesus. Bring everything under Jesus. See, here's the thing standing between some of us and peace. Jesus is the Tsar Shalom. Jesus is the Lord of Shalom, but He's only a consultant to our circumstances. Like we want His input, we want His advice, we want His eyes, we want His help, but we want Him to leave the decisions up to us. And look, there's no Shalom there. Think of it this way. A bunch of us are going to leave here this morning after the service, We're going to pull out onto the parking lot and turn south on Hewlin. If you've been here before, you know where that goes. And you get to that intersection on Hewlin and 20, we're all going to go our different ways. That's sort of a hairy intersection there at Hewlin and 20 today. But most of us, even though it's a hairy intersection, we don't really think about it a lot. Even as we're going through it, you wouldn't have thought about it today if I hadn't brought it up, even if you drove through it today. But imagine if today you just decided on the way. You know, while I'm thinking about it, I'm just going to drive through that intersection today and I'm going to pay absolutely no attention to the stoplight, whatever it says. You know what would happen? In a place where you could normally find peace, you would not experience peace. And do you know why? Because you'd be living outside the boundaries that make peace possible in that place for you. You see that? So here's what's happened for some of us. We know Jesus. We see Jesus. We worship Jesus. We've trusted Jesus, believe in Jesus. We're going to heaven when we die. We sing the songs and send the cards and love the holiday and Jesus is our Savior. And yet in one area or another in our life, He's our Savior. He is not the Tsar. God has given us boundaries and principles and direction and commands not to keep us from things that would bring us peace, but to protect us from things that can destroy our peace. So we say, Jesus, thanks for the advice on how to live in relationships with my husband or my wife or my parents or my kids or my enemies or my neighbors or my friends. That's great advice. I've taken it into account. But they've really made me mad. Like they really hurt me bad. They never love me back. They're never going to change. They're always going to be like this. And Jesus, your, idea, your, your advice is, is good, but I'm going to do this in the real today, and we step out of the boundaries and the commands that God put in place to protect our peace. And then we wonder why we only ever see flickers and glimmers and snapshots of peace. I know what God commands about my finances. Give off the top, save for the future, live on the rest. I know that's great advice, but I'm going to decide to do this. That's why some of us don't find peace with our finances. The Tsar Shalom is not the Tsar of our finances, of our sexuality, of our parenting priorities, of our dating relationships. And listen, when we step outside of the boundaries that are in place for our peace, we're going to find some stuff to worry about. We're not going to flourish there. We're not going to find wholeness there. We're not going to live the ideal there. You see that? See, some of us don't have peace this year. And already right this second, you know that's why. 
There are whole areas of your life that you haven't brought under Jesus. And it just so happens you can draw a straight line from those areas to the areas in your life that are fractured and broken and shattered and vandalizing your shalom. Bring everything under Jesus, the Tsar of Shalom. It's the first thing, but what about those of us that would say, I don't think that fits me. Like, I've trusted Christ as Savior, and as much as I can, as much as I know how, I'm following Him. And I'm willing to submit everything to Him and bring everything under Him. I'm serving Him and I'm obeying Him. Like, He's my Tsar, and I still don't have Shalom, except in snapshots. What about us? Well, let me give you a second thing. Fix your focus on Jesus. Bring everything under Jesus and fix your focus on Jesus. Hey, think about it this way related to this verse. If you've ever been the czar of anything, like you were the point leader for your junior high debate team or student council or you've led a club or an organization or a family, maybe a division or a whole company at work, you know that there's a moment where when the discussion is over, and nobody's totally sure what to do, and somebody has to make a decision, everyone is going to focus their eyes on someone. Who are they going to look to? They're going to look for the Tsar. Leadership's about responsibility before it's ever about power. And that's why, right? Someone's going to have to shoulder the responsibility when nobody else is sure what to do. Who is it? It's the Tsar. Wouldn't it be something to have a Tsar of life who was a wonderful counselor? with supernatural, mighty God power, who was totally secure in their role and cared for you like an everlasting father. Gosh, if someone like that could be the star of my life, I'd have shalom a lot more than I do. Look, can I show you another verse? Flip over to Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3 says this. It says, you, talking to God, will keep him in perfect peace. Him whose mind is stayed on you. I don't know that mind stayed on you is always the place that my mind goes in the chaos. When circumstances come or the place or the pace need to change or the people or the problems need to disappear, I start focusing on how to solve the problem. Like what I'm owed, what we need to do, where we need to go, or at least where you need to go, right? Strategy, pity party, guilt trip, I do all of that. And my focus gets fractured, not fixed. It's not stayed. It's scattered. No shalom. God will keep him or her in perfect shalom. Him or her whose mind are stayed on him. Fix your focus on Jesus. Okay, that sounds ideal. How do I do that? in the real, when it's chaos in the world, or chaos in my world, and Jesus is the Tsar, but there is no shalom. Well, some time ago, someone along the way taught me five really great diagnostic questions that for me are the ticket for fixing my eyes on Jesus, and they're really simple. Okay, let me give them to you, and then I'll give you an example. Here they are. First question is this, what just happened? Second, what am I experiencing now? Third, what's the story I'm telling myself? Fourth, what does the gospel say? What does Jesus say? And fifth, what counter instinctual action is needed? Okay, so some of you are writing those down. We'll leave them up long enough to give you time to get them. Okay, so what just happened? Sometimes that's the hardest thing, isn't it? Like to slow down enough that you even realize that something has disrupted your shalom. What just happened? And then think through, what am I experiencing now? Like, how is it affecting me? Is my heart racing? Is my mind spinning? Am I feeling something like fear or shame or anxiety? And then third, what's the story I'm telling myself? Like all of us imagine we're in the loop on the director cut of our story, right? Where we can imagine what everybody's thinking and where the story's headed and why people did what they did when they did. The problem is we don't always see it that clearly. We make some of that stuff up, so we've got to ask, what story am I telling? So that we can ask, what does the gospel say? What does Jesus say? Who sees it perfectly? And then, what counter-instinctual action is necessary? 
And while you're writing them down, let me just show you how it works. I, I found myself this week in a conversation with a person none of you know. And at the end of the conversation, it just didn't, hadn't gone well. Like I hadn't done anything wrong. They hadn't done anything wrong. It's not like there was something that wasn't under Jesus, but I wasn't experiencing peace, right? You know how that goes. So here's how this questions go. Like what just happened? Well, I had a bad conversation. What am I experiencing now? Well, I'm, I'm feeling embarrassed and exposed. Like I'm a moron that didn't know the answer to a question that a person expected me to have known. Hey, what's the story that I'm telling myself right now? You blew it. Like, what a screw up. You're never going to amount to anything significant, and everybody knows it. Right? No shalom in that, right? Question four, what does the gospel say? What does Jesus say? You know what it says? It says that Jesus sees me. He knows everything there is to know about me. He loves me. He chose to rescue me. He's called me and gifted me to be a critical part of His mission for the specific place that He sent me, not because I'm a pastor, but because I'm a witness of resurrection, right? And in Christ, through the present power of God's Spirit, I have everything I need to pull off what He's called me to do. And that's significant. I'm significant as a result of that. And question five, that's important. What counterintuitive step do I need to take? I mean, think about it this way. The way you build muscle, it's to isolate a muscle and then pull or push against it, right? So when I experience something that I discover is pulling me away from the shalom of God, I want to pull against the pull. And that's not my instinct. It's not yours either. My instinct, your instinct, is to give in to the pull. So in my situation, feeling exposed and embarrassed, it makes me want to hide. How can I pull against that pull? Well, I'm going to choose to pull against the pull this way. I decided in this situation voluntarily to tell my wife about the conversation. The one human in the world whose opinion I care about more than anyone else's. Why? Because fixing my focus on Jesus set me free to live in the light of what's true and even expose what's presently broken because I know who Jesus is and I know what Jesus said. And I know what he's done. And he's the Sar Shalom. He's writing my story. So when I can't find Shalom, my eyes go to him. Fix your focus on Jesus. You got to keep coming back to that. Why? Because he's near. Remember Isaiah 9. The child is born. The son is given. He's with us. Emmanuel. I love what one author said. She said, when you know Emmanuel, God with us, with is Emmanuel's middle name. And that's really what we need, isn't it, in a world like this? We need the God of peace, not just to send snapshots of peace. We need Him with us. We need Him near us, not just in heaven someday when we die. We need Him near us in the darkness, in the chaos, in the hard, in the valley, in the broken, scattered, fractured world where we live, in the real, we need Him with us. We need Him near us for every single step. And you notice that about the promise in Isaiah chapter 9? That's who the promise of God with us, Emmanuel, that's who He's sent to be with. He's not sent to people who are past it. Not sent to people who have it all figured out, have their world put together, and just needed a boost just for a second. He was sent to people living in darkness. He was sent to the middle of the transition, to the chaos, to the despair, to the brokenness, to the hopeless world as the Sar Shalom, not just to point us to peace someday, but to carry us in peace today. Listen to this passage, also in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 12. It says, Lord, you establish peace, Shalom, for us. All that we have accomplished, check this out, you have done for us. See, people who broke shalom can't fix their own shalom. It's like a two-year-old trying to use messy hands to clean up their messy face. Like, it just doesn't work. If peace is going to be established around us, if it's going to be established within us, when it comes to us and God, if it's going to be established between us, God was going to have to do it for us. And listen, Merry Christmas. He has unto us 
a child is born, a son is given, who lived a perfect life, unbroken, unfractured, completely connected to God, who experienced the unraveling of all of it, the full extent of the opposite of shalom, exposed, weak, vulnerable, betrayed, desperate, forsaken, scared, dying, and dead, alone. So that everything you fear from God and everything we deserve from God, we don't have to experience. And He conquered the dead. And He rose to new life. And He offers to give it to you. He has done it for us. And it's ours to receive as a gift. That's the last thing today. Bring everything under Jesus. Fix your focus on Jesus. And finally, find your life in Jesus. You will not find peace in the midst of the chaos without connecting to the one who holds all things together. Because peace isn't found in a politician. It's not found in a place. Not found at a pace. Not found by getting rid of a person or a problem. You can only find shalom in the presence and under the rule of someone, a Savior named Emmanuel. Would you bow your head with me? If this morning you realize you've never connected with Christ, you need to know that He sees you, that He loves you, that He's pursued you, and that He's paid for you. Everything you owed God, everything you deserved from God, He took on His shoulders and He died. And He took it all into a grave and He left it there. And then He rose from the dead and He offers you life and hope and forgiveness and purpose and perfect peace. And it's a gift that He offers you today. If you've never received the gift, you can do it right where you're sitting. It's as simple as just telling Him in your own words, Lord, I'll receive the gift. I'm putting trust in you and all of my trust for my shalom, for the ideal, for the world that you created me for and the person you created me to be. I'm putting it all in you and I'm trusting you with me. Father, for the person who's putting their trust in you in this moment, Lord, I pray that you would overwhelm them in this moment with peace. And Lord, that you would give them the courage to express that decision that they've made to put their trust in you to someone who can help them keep taking steps towards living in connection with you and fixing their focus on you. Lord, I pray for those of us that this morning are struggling to bring something under you. And I pray that you'd give us the courage to take the counter instinctual step of telling somebody about it, getting help, and walking shoulder to shoulder with somebody else towards you in every moment of every day. Would you let us be people who bring everything under you and fix our focus in you and find our life in you wherever we go? Would you give us strength? Would you give us courage? Would you show us how to live? Would you give us shalom this Christmas? We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.